So thanks again for, for the intro. Um, yeah, I think you said most of it. So uh, I know I just have half an hour to have a, a quick conversation about risk responsibilities and roles, which is something I, I basically want to talk about. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, I, I flocked to um, certainly web analytics um, back in 2000. Well, actually, I didn't flock to it. Somebody just dropped on my uh, desk a tool called uh, Web Trends Log Analyzer 6 many, many years ago and told me to do something with that. And um, my background is actually not at all in, uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I am actually, as I, I always tell um, the policymakers and the lawyers, a recovering dataholic. I studied econometrics and statistics, so I love data. I love playing around with data. And clearly back in the 2000s, it was the best way to actually get your hands on data was to kind of work in a, in a startup. And so this is where um, I, uh, for the first time, got in touch with this idea of measuring websites, flash websites also, for those who might remember. But the thing I really wanted to highlight here is that while we were measuring websites, there was another lady called Isabella at the time that was working on ads. And she was using tools like um, Real Media's 24-7 or... Um, Net Gravity's Dart, and these companies well basically were doing separate things from what Web Trends was doing by measuring the websites. There were um, one could say Chinese walls between them, and this kind of changed certainly when Google acquired DoubleClick some years later. In the sense that well, DoubleClick had acquired Web Abacus, they acquired Net Gravity, so this is the little Pacmans that you see. And then um, Google acquired DoubleClick as well, which in the end created DoubleClick for publishers, which was still kind of a separate world from Google Analytics because these links between ads and what you measure on the websites weren't there yet. But slowly but surely with the advent of big data, with the fact that more power was put into processing, um, and collecting information, well, we kind of saw this emergence of um, programmatic, of real-time bidding, and slowly but surely following that also the emergence of laws that now we've been working with for the last, what, five, six years called the GDPR. And we're looking forward to well, what's coming next in terms of enforcement. Um, on my side, um, having started off with Google Analytics, I've never been a big fan of SEO or ads. I don't believe in advertising. I confess totally. I'm, I'm a terrible, terrible consumer. Um, but I did flock and knock on the door of Crux, a DMP at the time, to better understand what the technology was and try to also kind of start working on this idea of competing on privacy which I think, for example, Jody is going to talk about a bit later today. So I worked for Crocs. They got acquired by Salesforce. And a couple of years later, I got this CDP knock on my door called Mparticle. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to work with US-based companies anymore because you scare me. What you're doing with data it really scares me in terms of evolution of our societies. But they came up with this plan called Open GDPR at the time a way to federate data subject rights between different partners. And I thought, ah, that's new, that's interesting. This is something I want to be a part of. And so I worked as a data protection officer. I'll talk about this a bit later also today for six years before now joining further as their DPO, which is an agency. And I think there will be talks by um, Rocket Mill who got acquired by further as well a bit later today. In the meantime, since the beginnings of Web Trends Log Analyzer 6 before the, the new millennium, we've seen um, the laws, GDPR, AI Act, the DMA that is going to start to be enforced as well. <clears throat> we've seen also court rulings and supervisory authorities, not only in Europe, like for example, the Belgians or the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, but certainly also the attorney general in California and um, the California Privacy Protection Agency um, pushing for interesting evolutions 
that are actually getting close to what the GDPR is also talking about. And then last bit of it is obviously also the actors within the markets, the markets, the data ecosystem. As we all talk about this very, very scary thing, apparently called the deprecation of uh, third party cookies or um, the uh, Google's privacy sandbox, which is also highly debated and of which um, the consent framework is a part of, that is going to be discussed today as well. So all in all, when I talked to Will about what I wanted to me mention, he told me this was going to be very complicated to explain what the privacy laws were going to be about. And what I'd like to put forward is actually um, it's not only the privacy legislation that is complicated, it's also the digital e ecosystem that we work with. So I don't know if anybody still remembers these very simple kind of um, tools that we used to use when it came, came to ads. So Dart, double click for publishers, but where it was very clear that, well, we were working just on these different um, ad sizes and trying to push some form of a decent advertising in some form of a banner on the publisher's website. And it was a simple way to start thinking about how to monetize websites. And it also made sense to see the evolution basically of this integration, certainly following the acquisition of DoubleClick and, and, and Google. It, it made sense at the time. I don't think anybody could have predicted the fact that it would have been probably better to work on contextual advertising, but it was not an idea that you could sell at the time. So I think we are seeing the evolution, the logical evolution of both markets and also the laws. And now the question is, how are we going to limit risk for our societies, for the companies we work for? but also for the data subjects that basically want to use digital and, and data and technology to better their lives. Um, so something that I, I wanted to highlight initially is, well, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the beginning, between Web Trends, Log Analyzer 6, and um, also Dart, there was a separation. There were Chinese walls. And you can draw parallels um, today with potentially one of um, the sectors that is maybe not in, in the best of uh, its growth periods for the last three or four decades is publishers. Publishers basically had the same idea that they should keep editorial independence from advertising as well, this thin line, this balancing act to support um, democratic values. And in a sense, what we're seeing is that, well, the way we're measuring has gone in the same directions as this lack of independence. But I think we need to go back potentially to where we came from before to say, well, maybe it would be a good idea to not um, cross data together all the time. So here are some examples. You might have heard also about um, what happened in terms of Chinese walls when it came to IPOs for the internet, um, the book, The Internet Bubble is really something I'd recommend. It talks about Mary Meeker working for Morgan Stanley at the, at the time. And also the fact that basically she didn't really respect Chinese walls. But today we are at a moment where what we're seeing is that we still have legislation, certainly in the United States, called Section 230, where platforms are not held accountable for the information that's being shared. And it might be time to start thinking about reversing that position today. So the first takeaway I would bring, like to bring to the table as we see evolution of privacy legislation is that when you're being asked to merge certain data points together, maybe you want to talk to somebody about this. And we've been through this entire um, era of let's collect everything and merge everything together. I think we are entering into the era of co-mingling would require some form of a sign-off by the person who's responsible for that to make sure that it abides by compliance obligation that keeps on evolving. 
So quick reminder about what is basically privacy and you know the simplest way to think about it. And I think if you don't have this in mind, you, you get to certain forms of clashes in terms of how people think about privacy, certainly between the two sides of the Atlantic, the pond as I call it. Basically in Europe, we talk always about opt-in legislation and in the United States, we talk about opt-out. And so it's a, it's a very simple idea is a lot of things are allowed in the United States unless some signal is being picked up. Whereas in Europe, it's more this idea of you are accountable for what you are doing. So start thinking about how you're going to document about this. And um, also, honestly, this is something that I, I actually stole from Jody in one of her decks from a prior um, webinar that she did with, um, with Measure Minds, because I think it's a very good way to get the conversation going so that everybody understands the initial premises of Privacy 101. And you might ask yourself, why, why is that? Why can't we all agree upon you know, the way that we're going to do this and what is law for acceptable for everybody? Well, basically it's very simple. The way laws are created are not the same in the different countries. We all depend upon the system upon which laws are created. And typically in Europe, I compare it as I'm based in Spain, to La Sagrada Familia, which is um, uh, um, a cathedral that has been created by Gaudi and <clears throat> is eternally under construction. And this is a bit how I see also the GDPR, but also the DMA, the DSA, the AI Acts, and, and other legislations that are certainly ro being rolled out and enforced. But there's basically two major ways of thinking about um, privacy legislation. The more um, su supportive of growth um, by using data in the United States, so it's really the focus on businesses and limited rights for individuals, consumers. Whereas the GDPR Europe talks about this idea that everything is based on fundamental rights and that companies should be accountable. So basically it's like the yin and the yang. We are looking at it from different angles. Sometimes it aligns, sometimes it doesn't. And this is basically where the, the, the sub subtlety of trying to do the best for your company lies, is trying to find a strategy with respect to data collection, but also with respect to compliance obligations. So generally speaking, if you look at it from a global perspective, there's more and more privacy laws that be, have been rolled out since the enforcement of the GDPR in 2018. And <clears throat> typically what we're also seeing is that most of these laws are actually opt-in laws. And so there are exceptions, but these exceptions are typically more Anglo-Saxon driven countries, the UK being the exception for the GDPR, UK's GDPR prior to Brexit. But most Anglo-Saxon countries, whether it's the US or Australia, are based on this, this idea of opt out. Other countries are kind of following this Brussels effect created by the GDPR, this ripple effect that is actually pushing for also typically opt-in laws. So we look at this here from a um, global perspective. What we're clearly seeing is still the United States is, is in red and we are still waiting for a federal law. I'm not holding my breath, certainly not this year when it comes to a year of elections. So a ripple effect, and if, if I had to basically sum it up, the picture here on the right of the tractor is how I see privacy law. It's moving slowly, but it's moving surely, and it's creating, I think, best practices in the market. Slowly, you can continue ignoring it, of course, but it keeps on moving forward. And sometimes it doesn't really smell very nice, certainly when it's hot. What is Europe working on? Um, I know this made some people really smile or laugh or cry at Super Week um, at the beginning of this year. 
But there's more than just the GDPR or even e-privacy we keep on discussing. And so I think you find this also within certain recitals of the GDPR is to say it's not just about privacy. It's about finding the right balance in terms of obligations to make sure that our societies go in the right direction. So privacy is not the only right that you should take into consideration. Freedom of expression is one as well that is very important, but it needs to be taken into consideration to find kind of the right balance for the uses of data within our societies. How does the United States look like? Well, um, an interesting patchwork of state legislations that also keep on moving forward. They have their own tractor and their own challenges as well. The big difference, I think, being for the United States that this idea of class actions do exist in terms of risk. And I, I want to talk a bit more about this um, a bit further down the, the, the slide deck. So this gives you an idea of where different states are. There's a lot more um, waiting to be passed. So we'll have to see where, well, basically in the end, um, US state law ends up. And if one day, potentially we might have a federal law. Um, I think one of the most important questions, I could certainly keep on asking my customers, whether they're in the United States, in Asia or in Europe, is basically what is your privacy compliance strategy? Are you going to consider that GDPR is the baseline? Is this viable for you in the long term? Should California CCPA be the US baseline? Are you going to adapt to each state separately? Well, it actually depends who you are within the data ecosystem. Obviously, what you can also do is be like the three monkeys. You don't speak, you don't hear, and you don't see. While at the same time, well, you might put forward an offer they can't refuse. And I'm not pointing fingers to anybody specifically, but what it's, what's clear is that when it comes to compliance obligations, certain actors within the digital ecosystem have more power than others. And so they are hedging for their own risks and potentially also pushing for certain proposals that would be difficult to refuse by other actors. So let's talk about risk. Let's, let's try to understand, moving away from these three monkeys, let's try to understand what, what privacy risk could be about. Well, first of all, how do laws actually come about? Well, there's a proposal for a law, and then they all discuss, and then suddenly the ink is dry on that law. The exception being here, the e-privacy regulation. So been, they've been discussing since 2021. We're still not there. We're still at a directive, which creates confusion, tensions, different types of interpretations, and also doesn't really allow for actual enforcement. Let's hope this will, will move forward. But once enforcement starts, well, people can complain, there's investigations, and then authorities like supervisory authorities are going to use their powers. So I invite you to take a look at Article 58, for example, of the GDPR, to see how the powers of supervisory authorities have been extended. They are a lot stronger than what they used to be on the, di the directive, but it also creates tensions. Um, once a complaint is, um, uh, put forward an enforcement has been decided upon, a fine, for example, well, companies can contest and say, no, I don't agree. And so they go typically to the European Court of Justice or the Court of Human Rights of the European Union. And basically what's happening there is typically we're buying time. Because before it gets in front of the European Court of Justice, it takes typically two years, if not more. This is, for example, something we're seeing with infamous Schrems decisions about international data transfers. We're expecting a Schrems 3 at some point in time. We'll have to see when, but within 18 months, maybe 24 months. Once this gets in front of the courts, there's a ruling and then in slowly but surely the market adapts. So what's interesting is between point one and point six, 
Sometimes you can wait for five, seven years. Between 0.5 and 0.6, three months. So once there's really a court ruling, for example, like Planet 49 on pre-ticked checkboxes, the market understands really fast what it needs to do. As long as we haven't gone through the different points, well, nothing much happens and everybody's acting like the three monkeys. And so this is basically how risk kind of evolves and you need to understand how this actually works. It also means that these obligations don't fall out of the sky. You see the new laws coming, you see when the ink is dry, you're starting to see enforcement and there's tools out there to actually follow this as well, to try to understand where all this comes from. How does it look like in the United States? Well, there's also some interesting evolutions. Um, certainly today against this actor you might have heard about called Google. Apparently they're, they're kind of not doing what they should when it comes to competition. So today there are trials starting. Um, after the summer, as of September 9th, there will be another trial also around um, uses by media and ads. And so it will be interesting to see what the outcomes might be. But I think a lot of people also imagine that, well, Europe is the one that's finding the most. Personally, I think the risk is actually coming out of the United States. And while I'm really happy to work on articles about, for example, Firebase, um, I'm not totally sure that in the long run, installing that solution might be good for business moving forward. But that's my personal interpretation. After all, this is still interesting, evolving territory. What are we seeing when it comes to these kinds of um, redresses in Europe? Well, I mentioned before that basically class actions was something we needed to think about in, in the United States. Actually, class actions are being tested in Europe as well. So there's this directive called the Collective Redress Directive. And you might have heard about certain countries like the UK, um, Portugal, but also the Netherlands, where certain law firms are trying to start thinking about class actions around data. What are we seeing in terms of class actions in the United States? Um, in 2023, so last year, there was like a surge of VPPA class action, Video Privacy Protection Act, actually a pretty old law um, that was being used by different law firms to try to basically get to settlements with different companies. And um, the way it actually works is that hedge funds are investing in law firms. And when there is a settlement, well, basically these actors get 15 to 30% of the settlement. So in a way, privacy class actions are becoming a way um, to make money and an interesting business model. And so I think we'll see more and more of this, certainly um, in the United States, but also certainly now that the Collective Redress Directive exists in Europe. So how you, should you tackle this now that you understand, well, basically um, how the laws work, how the different actors react? Well, I think the first thing to understand is maybe that there are certain people that are picking up the hot potatoes within the company when it comes to privacy and certainly actors like data protection officers. Um, I often get the question about what do you actually do? Well, um, I typically talk to the lawyers to try to understand what they promise to the data subjects, the consumers, and then look at the contracts to make sure that everything that's promised within these contracts is actually followed up. Um, DPOs are increasingly required within privacy laws from a global perspective. They are defined within Article 37 to 39. Um, but the, the thing I really wanted to highlight here is that a data protection officer doesn't make decisions. A data protection officer typically monitors compliance and gives advice. And then when the advice is given, somebody needs to decide how the data is going to be used. And so it's an important part, I think, of the role of the D DPO to assure that a decision belongs to a department or a person, 
and to say, well, if you're uh, responsible for product, for example, you are the person accountable for that decision. Another point that is also important to understand is the difference between a data protection officer and general counsel or privacy counsel. The risk the DPO is trying to limit or minimize is the risk to the data subject. So basically a DPO works for the data subjects, not directly for the company. And so this is kind of um, a very subtle but important um, differentiation between privacy council and data protection officers is in the end, we are all about the people. We're all about making sure that, well, data is deleted, data retentions are respected, lawful basis exists, consent signals are being picked up and things like that to limit compliance for the companies, but also making sure that in the end, the way data is being used is for the benefit of society in general and not just for the company that hires you or pays you. So as I mentioned, um, we are not created equal between the United States and Europe. It's important to understand that certainly in the United States, as there is no fundamental fundamental right to privacy, it also means that data is considered as oil as a way of growth for companies and that there is discussion about data ownership by companies. In Europe, we consider that, well, basically personal data or personal information is not a market. And so this is like the biggest clash, I think, between the two um, continents that we'll see. Other continents are ra rather independent with respect to this, but data brokers in Europe is something that is contested and discussed about. So I'll have to see, well, basically where this is going. On the other hand, there are a lot of similarities between certainly European law and American law. And I think we should all work towards making sure this goes in the same direction, or hoping that basically the courts will kind of rule and figure out how to think about data as a property. In the US, the way it actually works is you can use data unless there's a signal that is about um, opting out or somebody says, I don't want you to use my data in that way. So typically US companies um, use this idea of not selling or, or sharing personal information. And this then depends basically, as I said before, per US state. So it's getting rather complicated in, in the United States, but if there's one thing you need to remember is it's about respecting these opt-out signals. If somebody says no, then you need to respect that and also make sure this is what you actually declare in your, your privacy notices as well. For Europe, it's slightly more, more it's slightly different. What we're talking about typically is as it's an opt-in law, you need um, a lawful basis and a purpose for processing personal data. Unlike the United States that typically talks about consent because it's typically opt out, there are six lawful bases for processing personal data in Europe of which consent. And a data controller needs to define purpose and means. So the data controller, the one in front of the data subjects is really the one that's going to decide what's going to happen. The data processor behind that is typically the one that just follows upon the written instructions. Something to remember also that is rather important when we're talking about e-privacy, which is just about electronic communications, so specifically terminal equipment, the only lawful basis that exists is consent. So when you think about being compliant from uh, a European GDPR e-privacy perspective. It's all about making sure you have a lawful basis and, and a purpose. Whereas in the United States, it's about respecting any opt-out signals. So the signals you're going to adapt to are the opposite one way or another. You need the positive signal to continue processing. You need to stop processing if you get a signal in the US. Um, so it's a bit in a, in a nutshell how to think about it. When we think about data processors, well, as I mentioned, the ones behind 
are typically the ones that act upon the written instructions of the data controllers. They don't define what's the purpose or the means of processing. Basically, they're just doing what the data controller says. And this is kind of a challenge as well, because sometimes we're seeing data processors that do a bit more, or we're seeing also data controllers that you know don't always give written instructions. So this is a way to start thinking also about hedging for risk is to say, well, if I act as a data processor, I want to make sure that I get those um, written instructions and I can prove that I'm acting upon those written instructions. And the obligations typically between controls and processors are defined within the contracts such as data protection agreements, which have been signed. It started with the GDPR in 2018, but we're certainly seeing this more and more also in, in the United States coming up to make sure that both parties basically respect each other and abide by the contracts between these two parties. Um, what does this mean? Um, generally speaking, then, for data controllers or businesses, well, they have to vet the tools that they're going to use to support their business. More and more, and certainly in the United States also, we're talking about impact assessments. If you're going to vet a tool or you're going to use data for a new purpose, um, start documenting the, the typical measures that you have. You respect the signals and the data subject rights of individuals. So either those opt-out signals or those um, DSARs that you get from data subjects in Europe. And we're seeing more and more this idea, certainly with the AI Act, that you need to address automated decision-making. So this idea that if you predict something, if it has um, legal effect on individuals, like for example, the fact that a credit is being refused, you need to be able to explain why this decision has been made. So there was a recent court ruling also called Shufa at the European Court of Justice that puts it at the forefront and the California Privacy Protection Agency is talking about this as well. So more transparency when it comes to um, decision making using automated means. Um, Next step is what we're seeing also from the setup of companies within um, the market. What we're basically seeing is that not all actors understand their obligations or how these roles between data controller or data processors are being set up. It seems rather simple, but sometimes um, certainly certain data processors are kind of pushing for signature of contracts that puts obligations around due diligence on the wrong party. Um, so I want to, I'm just leaving you with this slide where I basically set up the different relationships for you to think about what it means in terms of risk, depending on what kind of role you play within the ecosystem. My recommendation typically is the first scenario where an agency signs with their customers and where a tool signs with their customers and not that they piggyback each other. Because as an agency, you can't be responsible for what the tool actually provides. And you don't have enough power to do that. So keep this in mind, use this when talking to um, legal counsel if you want. Reach out if you have any questions, but this is really the crux of the matter is how your, your contracts are going to be set up in terms of obligations. Last, one of the last slides I wanted to share with you, how does Apple define tracking? So this idea of linking user data, um, collecting it from apps um, between different companies. This is how Apple defines tracking. This is not the law. This is not how the GDPR defines data processing. And so each actor basically hedges for their own risk. So keep that in mind. Ask yourself, who am I playing? Which role do I have within the ecosystem? Also ask for the contracts and see what is being proposed or what is being promised to your customers or by your vendors to understand where your obligations lie. 
So I know this is kind of a, a, a long setup around a lot of things. I, I understand there's a lot to digest here, but really important is understand who you are within the ecosystem, understand what you're processing exactly. And sometimes your role really varies. Sometimes you can be processing something under as a data controller or data processor with the same tool. Where you're doing that and what your risk appetite is based on those legal contracts. And I, in my opinion, this is always a collaborative effort. If you have legal counsel that says no, that's fine, but it's always negotiable. And then the question is, help me define mitigating measures so that we move that needle from no to yes. And that is always, I think, possible. So I hope this was useful. Thank you. And um, I'll stop sharing now.